So when uh, you have, uh, uh, as, as I mentioned, all the uh, waveforms are stored in the database, so for each event that we record in Opera, we are able to uh, associate it to its uh, proton uh, waveform. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you have seen, uh, we, we cannot, uh, we don't know uh, within the spill which is the proton which has uh, uh, produced the neutrino which interacts in Gran Sasso. So uh, we can uh, uh, perform this measurement of the neutrino velocity in statistical way by comparing the distribution of neutrinos in Gran Sasso to, this, uh, to the waveforms which are recorded at CERN. So in order to do that, we sum all the waveforms corresponding to the events which are uh, recorded by OPERA. And uh, this has to be done separately for the two extractions because, as I mentioned, they have a different uh, timing. And then we can compare this kind of distributions to the neutrino events. By opera. So the, the answer is yes, because the a slight difference uh, between the uh, proton velocity and the C in bringing the protons to the target. This accounts for a few uh, picoseconds. And then uh, also the particles, the mesons, which are produced by the interactions of the protons in the target are relativistic. So uh, you can get an idea from this analytic formula. And uh, you have a difference uh, with, uh, uh, with respect to the, uh, by, uh, if you assume that all, everything, the mesons and the protons, they, they travel at the speed of light, or you uh, take into account uh, uh, all the details of the uh, velocities of the mesons, you have a difference which goes as the uh, gamma square of the mesons. And this can be uh, precisely computed because we have a full simulation of the beam line. And uh, it's a completely negligible effect. And uh, it goes also in the direction of uh, uh, delaying uh, uh, the, uh, the neutrinos. Okay, so in this, uh, in this uh, uh, slide, there is a sketch of the principle of the measurement. So uh, we measure the, the, the proton waveforms uh, with the BCT then we know precisely the distance from the point where they are measured, the BCT and the opera reference frame with the geodesy and also the knowledge of the beam line at CERN. Shift the waveforms measured at CERN. These waveforms are tagged with respect to the UTC. We can shift them by taking into account the uh, time of flight which corresponds to this uh, distance divided by C. And then we compare uh, this uh, shifted waveform to the data recorded in Gran Sasso, which are also uh, UTC time tagged with this uh, high accuracy system which synchronizes at one nanosecond level. Then by computing uh, the difference between the two distributions, we can estimate a possible deviation uh, of the neutrino time of flight with respect to this uh, time of flight computed by assuming uh, C. So the, the geodesy is a, it's a very important ingredient, and in order to be accurate, uh, we had a, a dedicated campaign at uh, uh, Gran Sasso in 2010. So the, the main difficulty is not to uh, measure the positions outside, but to bring them uh, underground, as you, you can expect. So uh, during this campaign, there were two new uh, GPS reference points which were installed at the um, two ends of the tunnel, of the highway tunnel. And then uh, uh, this information was brought underground independent optical triangulations. And by doing this, uh, we introduced a, a, a systematic inaccuracy, an, an error which is of the order of 20 centimeters, which is dominating our measurement. So uh, I, I have also to say that when the, these two independent uh, uh, measurements, they matched at the center, they were in, in very good agreement. So here you can see then the uh, coordinates of these external references in the GPS reference system. They are expressed in this ETRF 2000, 
which is a European uh, global system, which accounts also for effects related to the Earth dynamics, the continental drift. And uh, by using these measurements, you can uh, combine uh, to the measurements taken at CERN in order to uh, c compute the baseline. So the measurements which were taken at CERN were taken uh, uh, when the uh, CNGS beam was started in 1998. All these uh, geodynamics calculations are quite accurate, so uh, we could have trusted the porting of this measurement through time. But then as a cross-check, we decided to repeat again the measurements at CERN and in Gran Sasso simultaneously. This was done in June 2011 in order to get more confidence on the result, and this confirmed the other result. So this is the, the distance between the BCT and the origin of the opera reference frame, and it is known at 20 centimeter level, which are dominated by this procedure to port underground the external measurements. By having this high accuracy system, we can also monitor the position of the antenna in the external laboratory. And this is what we see on a very long uh, period. So you, you see uh, this smooth curve, uh, curve which corresponds to the continental drift. And then in April uh, 2009, there was the effect of the earthquake, which displaced the laboratory by about seven centimeters in the east and north direction. So this is just to give you a, an idea of the accuracy uh, with which you can uh, perform this kind of measurements which is uh, uh, maybe unusual for uh, high energy physics, but is, uh, is uh, standard for uh, high accuracy ge geodesy measurements. Okay, then uh, uh, we have the, uh, the system is not so simple because we have two uh, chains for timing at CERN and in Gran Sasso, and they must be calibrated uh, piece by piece. And we use uh, two uh, techniques which are as inclusive as possible. So the idea is to measure uh, each time the uh, delay between two reference points in the timing chain without, for instance, uh, measuring uh, single elements with different techniques, like, uh, for instance, uh, optical fibers. We do not measure the optical fiber with other techniques, but we try to perform an inclusive measurement which is directly related to the timing used by our measurement. So there are two techniques in order to do that. The first one is the portable cesium clock. So you have one of these cesium clocks and you can measure the phase of its signal, which is produced once per second, with respect to the signal at the start of the chain and at the end of the chain. So there are various ways of doing that, either with a digital scope or by performing a time tagging. And then the other uh, uh, technique is to perform a double path measurement. In this case, uh, you introduce a, another path of propagation of the signal uh, with an optical fiber parallel to the path that you have to measure. And at the, at the end, you measure uh, the difference between the two uh, times, the, the two travel times of the signals. Then uh, by using exactly the same chain, uh, by just uh, reverting the transmitter and the receiver, you, you chain the, the signal from the end down to the start and you measure the sum of the two paths. And then by resol solving a system of two equations in two unknowns, you can uh, uh, measure uh, separately uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the additional path and the unknown path. And we have been using these two techniques in parallel for all the measurements we performed, and they gave the same result without the systematic uncertainty, which is typical at the, typically at the nanosecond level. Okay. For what concerns the BCT calibration, uh, this is a more delicate story. We performed a dedicated beam experiment. So this delay is uh, mainly the cable, which is used to bring the signal from the BCT to the uh, waveform digitizer, which is in the former UA2 counting room. But we, uh, as you have seen, we, we, we tried the first attempt by using the cesium clock, the portable cesium clock, and injecting the signal in the BCT. But then there was the question, is this really representative of what the protons do? And then we decided to check directly what the protons do in the BCT, and this was done with this uh, dedicated beam experiment where we had uh, two beam pickup detectors on the line. 
So we, we target the time, the transit time of the protons in these two detectors, and by knowing uh, the, um, well, with the survey, the geometry of the line, we could predict the transit time of the protons in the BCT, and then compare to the signal that we were measuring in the, uh, in the counting room. So this kind of technique uh, gives uh, an accuracy of 5 nanoseconds. And as I say, this delay is mainly determined by, by the cable, but we wanted really to be sure to have something which uh, uh, was representative of uh, what the protons do. So in order to do that, we use a special uh, beam condition. We use the LHC beam which has bunches of one nanosecond and uh, uh, they are separated by 50 nanoseconds. So you get a comb of this uh, uh, kind of point-like uh, pulses that then you can overlay, this is before the calibration, you can overlay with the signal of the BCT and this is the result after uh, having uh, overlaid the two which allows you to uh, measure this delay of uh, 580 nanoseconds. So here is a description of the timing chain at CERN. So as I said, we have this uh, uh, standard GPS, pre-existing GPS. Then we have the high accuracy one, the Polar X. And we have this uh, DAQ system, which is uh, made by these uh, devices, which are commonly used at CERN for uh, time tagging, which are called the CTRI. And uh, there is one of these devices in the previous uh, central control room where we have defined this uh, uh, reference point, which we call the T-CERN, which will be then uh, compared to a, a similar reference points in Gran Sasso for this synchronization at the nanosecond level. Then this uh, uh, timing is distributed through uh, a system to the different uh, CTRI, and we measure this delay by using the cesium clock and also by performing a two-way measurement. It goes in the CTRI, which is uh, sitting in the UA2 control room, where it is used to, to time tag the kicker signal and also to start the waveform uh, digitizer window, which is started 30 nanoseconds after the time tag of the kicker signal. So uh, the, the, then the BCT is uh, connected through this cable to the waveform digitizer, and uh, there is this additional delay with respect to the transit time of the protons in the BCT. The BCT is uh, 100 meters uh, far from the target. So in Gran Sasso we have a, a similar picture where we had uh, the existing uh, uh, GPS system, then the high accuracy one which makes the link to CERN. This is the reference point for the time link uh, between CERN and Gran Sasso. And then uh, this, the signal of the standard GPS signal uh, the system in Gran Sasso is sent every millisecond underground to the Opera Master Clock, which is here. This delay was measured also with uh, two techniques by using the portable cesium clock and this uh, two uh, path measurement. And then uh, the Opera Master Clock distributes uh, the signal to the sensors and we take as a reference the last sensor of the chain. Uh, the sensors in each chain are aligned by uh, dedicated measurements. And uh, also this uh, delay was measured in two ways, both by using the cesium and the two-way technique. And then we had to also to measure the uh, latency of the FPGA in performing the time tag. And this was measured by performing uh, the, a time measurement at the same time with the data acquisition and with an external digital scope. And then you have the delays related to the detector. So uh, there, there, I will go in more details later, but you can imagine that you have a delay from the time you get an interaction uh, uh, in the, uh, you get a particle which is measured, which produces light in the, in the uh, scintillator strip, and the time the FPGA sees a trigger. So you have the transit time in the photomultiplier, the uh, time response of the analog chip which produces the trigger and so on. So these delays are, on average, the total delay of the detector response is, on average, about 60 nanoseconds. So this, de this delay of the detector was measured also by using a technique with uh, uh, a picosecond uh, uh, laser, UV laser, which was injecting the scintillator strips in different points. And then we could extrapolate the time response 
uh, down to the surface of the photocathode in order to get the constant time which is given by the uh, transit time in the, in the photomultiplier, the response of the uh, analog chip which produces the trigger uh, and the porting of the signal to the FPGA. So then uh, there are other effects like uh, the position of the event in the strip, the, the dependence on the pulse site of the uh, trigger delay on the pulse site, and the quanti quantization effect which are accounted by simulations which take into account parametrizations of the uh, time response of the strips which have been uh, um, derived from laboratory measurements. Okay, so this is a table. I, I, I don't want you to, to go through the numbers, but which includes all the delays which uh, uh, these measurements. And what is interesting is to see that uh, everything has been measured with uh, uh, different techniques. So all the delays of the chains were, uh, as I said, were measured with this portable cesium and also the two ways measurement. So this uh, two ways measurement, for instance, for what concerns the distribution of the UTC time at CERN, we kept uh, uh, permanently working since uh, July 2011 uh, up to now. So this is a plot which shows you the uh, variations of this uh, delay uh, with respect to the nominal value. And you see uh, the kind of accuracy here, the full scale uh, it corresponds to plus minus 0.4 nanoseconds. So it's uh, well within uh, the uh, systematic accuracy that we have been uh, mentioning uh, before. Okay, now we go to the other side, to the event selection in opera. So the, the result of this measurement is based on uh, 10 to the 20 protons on target. As I mentioned, we take both internal and external events, and they uh, have a, uh, comparable statistics. So the internal events are about 7 uh, 1,500 and the external one, 800, uh, 8,500. So the uh, possible bias on external events where the neutrino interacts in the rock, they've been checked the, with the Monte Carlo simulation and they uh, correspond to a two nanosecond systematic uncertainty when they are added to the internal events. And the, uh, the way to make sure that there is not a large bias is to uh, require that there is a high energy muon entering in the detector. In this case, uh, the particle is relativistic and there is no uh, bias uh, on the time of flight. There is little bias on the time of flight of this secondary particle. Then this, this kind of bias we have been also checking directly because we could analyze separately the internal and external events as I will show you in a, in a moment. So once we get the events in the detector, they go through two kinds of corrections. The first one that I described before is the correction of the time link. And the second one is the uh, correction by the position of the earliest state, which defines the time of the event. So uh, since the baseline has been, was computed with respect to this point, which is the origin of the opera reference frame, uh, one has to take into account the position of the, of the it and what matters is the longitudinal position along the beam. And we have an average corre correction for how the events are distributed of 140 centimeters, which correspond to 4.7 nanoseconds. And this uh, also we have been checking by performing the analysis with and without the correction, and it, it agrees uh, completely with the uh, Z distribution. Okay, the analysis method. So as I mentioned, for each event in opera, we can get its uh, proton waveform, then we can uh, sum them up, and we can get the uh, a probability distribution function which will represent the time distribution of events detected by opera. We get two, one for each extraction because the two extractions have a different timing, and then we can enter in uh, this uh, uh, probability distribution function with the time of the event and uh, compute a likelihood function and we can do these do in steps by adding these uh, extra parameters which describes the deviation from the uh, TOF computed assuming the speed of light. And uh, here you see the result, this uh, log likelihood plot, which uh, uh, gives you the delay uh, for the blind analysis. So you get this value which is uh, uh, 1048 nanoseconds 
which is deliberately uh, large, as I will explain later, because in order to prevent that we could infer on the result without really knowing the calibration of all the elements of the, of the chain. So this blind analysis was done by ignoring many facts. So we were referring to a, a, a wrong baseline, uh, which was taken as a reference point, not the BCT used for the measurement, but by another one, which is in the SPS. So we just kept this procedure, which is, of course, wrong, and will give you a, a, a huge uh, offset. We were ignoring the details of the time response and the DAQ in opera. We were using some old GPS intercalibration, which was done in 2006 by bringing the standard GPS system from CERN to Gran Sasso and looking at the difference between the two systems. We were ignoring the BCT and waveform digitizer delays and also the UTC calibration at CERN. So this results in this very large difference of 1,048 nanoseconds. And we decided to open the box to look at the real result in March when we knew all the delays. And in particular, the last one that we had to know was the geodesy. It was the result of the integration of the measurements taken in Gran Sasso with the measurements taken at CERN. So uh, this is the result of the likelihood uh, maximization. So here you have the, the, the curves of the protons and the neutrino distribution uh, in opera before uh, performing the likelihood maximization. And then uh, you can overlay them by correcting by the result of the likelihood maximization, which is this 1048.5 nanoseconds. And you see that there is a quite nice agreement. The uh, neutrino events in Gran Sasso are described by the shape of the protons which is measured at CERN. And in particular, you see the leading uh, uh, and falling edges of the distribution, which are quite important in this measurement, which match the data points. This is better shown in this zoom, where you can see after uh, overlaying with the likelihood maximization result, the fronts for the first and second extraction. Oh, you see that there is a very good agreement between the experimental points and the cube, which is just one of the protons, just shifted by the result, this delta t computed with the likelihood. We performed several cross-checks of the analysis. So uh, this analysis can be performed for the two extractions separately, which have completely different timing, but they give the same result. And then it can be computed year by year, uh, the data taken in 2009, 2010, and 2011, compared to the overall uh, result. And then we arbitrary subsamples, for instance, by taking the, the data, uh, the neutrino events which occur during the night or the day, and the two beans, they agree within the errors, so we saw a difference of Seventeen nanoseconds between the two beams, plus with an error of 15 point. And again, the result is a difference of 11 nanoseconds with an error of 14.3. And then the other legitimate question was to remove the external events. And by taking, this is the result with, which includes external and internal events. By taking only the internal events, you get a result which is compatible within the systematic accuracy that we were expecting from the Monte Carlo simulation. So then uh, after having uh, performed this cross-check and by knowing uh, the, all the uh, calibration delays, we could open the box. And this is a table which summarizes the differences between uh, the uh, blind analysis, the, the situation which was corresponding to 2006, and the final analysis. So as uh, I mentioned, we were assuming a wrong baseline. We were not taking into account the uh, final UTC calibration, we were not taking into account the BCT and the waveform digitizer, we were not taking into account the delays in the detector, and finally, we were not taking into account the time link, but some uh, prior GPS synchronization. So, if you take into account all these factors, 
you get to a global shift of uh, minus 987.8 nanometers. seconds and the other table describes or considering uh, uh, by neglecting the, the uh, velocity of the pions uh, the uh, bias is very small uh, the bias on the interaction point in Gran Sasso for external events the measurement of the UTC delay the measurement of the delay in the distribution of the signal in Gran Sasso from the external clock to the inter to the underground all and the transmission of the synchronization of, of the DQ system, the FPGA latency, the waveform, uh, fast waveform digitizer trigger delay, the synchronization among the two sites, the uh, systematic uncertainty on the Monte Carlo simulation, which is used in order to evaluate the uh, position dependence, the response of the target tracker, and the BCT calibration. So all these uncertainties added in quadrature, they amount to 7.4 nanoseconds. So this is the as a sampling calorimeter with this uh, lead blocks and the uh, target tracker. And uh, the, dif the difference, well, you will see the difference between the two beams, but uh, here there is the result expressed for these internal events for which we know the energy, which is uh, an anticipation of 60.3 nanoseconds uh, corresponding to an average event energy of 28 GB. So this is not the average neutrino energy in the beam, is for interacting neutrino, is a higher energy. So this is the result uh, by considering these two beams in energy, where we do not see a significant uh, energy dependence within the statistical accuracy of our measurement, which is uh, uh, not very good when you start taking the internal events, you lose statistics, and you see, then you divide uh, even the sample in, in two parts, and the statistical uncertainty is large. And here you can see the overall result for which there is no energy scale, because this includes also the external. The detector at LNGS uh, has allowed the most uh, sensitive terrestrial measurement of the neutrino velocity over a baseline of about 730 kilometers. So we improved by about a factor uh, 10 with respect to the previous measurement of MINUS. We profited of the large statistics which was accumulated by OPERA, 16,000 events, of this dedicated upgrade of the CNGS and OPERA timing systems, 
an accurate geodesy campaign and a series of calibration measurements which were conducted with different and complementary techniques. The analysis of data from 2009, 2010, and 2011, part of 2011, the 2011 run is still going, was carried out to measure the neutrino time of flight for CNGS mu neutrinos traveling through the Earth crust with an average energy of 17 GB. The result of the analysis uh, indicate an early neutrino arrival time with respect to the one computed by assuming the measured baseline divided by the speed of light of uh, 60.7 plus minus 6.9 plus minus 7.4 nanoseconds. So we spent six months in uh, various cross-checks. We cannot explain the observed effect in terms of non-systematic uncertainty. Therefore, uh, we uh, present to you today this uh, discrepancy, this anomaly, with respect to uh, what we would have expected uh, by assuming the speed of light. And this is a, as an overall significance of six sigmas. So we also investigated the possible energy dependence of the effect in the energy domain which is covered by the CNGS beam. And within the statistical accuracy of the measurement, you have seen that the errors are quite large. Uh, we do not observe any significant effect. And now I have to add the many words of uh, caution uh, from uh, all us. So uh, despite the large uh, significance of this measurement that you have seen, and the stability of the analysis, since it has a potentially great impact on physics, this motivates the continuation of our studies in order to identify still unknown systematic effects, and we look also forward to independent measurements from other experiments. And for the same reasons, we do not attempt any theoretical or phenomenological interpretation of the result. Thank you.